This video is brought to you by Shortform. Every month, I make a trip to the pharmacy. I have asthma, so I need to pick up an inhaler so it'll make it easier for me to breathe. Otherwise, this is what I sound like. When I stop to think about it, this inhaler is kind of crazy to me. A doctor prescribed it to me and told me to take it every day. I can barely pronounce its name, and I don't know exactly what I'm inhaling, but despite all of this, I know that it'll make me feel better. I can literally feel it in my lungs when I forget to take it for a day. The same can be said for any medicine that we take. Have you ever stopped to wonder what kinds of tests these medicines need to go through so that we can just take them and know that they'll generally work? Statistics plays a key role in vetting these medicines, and most people aren't even aware of it. So in this video, I'm going to lift the veil on how statisticians use the power of randomness to make sure our medicines work. If you're new here, thanks for tuning in. My name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. Let's get started. When I take my inhaler, I know that it's going to make it easier for me to breathe. When you take an aspirin for a headache, you have a pretty good idea that it's going to work. At first glance, there doesn't seem to be anything statistical about this. So let me dig a little deeper. In both of these cases, we're counting on the fact that these medicines have a proven causal relationship with our symptoms. They make them go away. In statistics, when we talk about relationships, we're most likely referring to correlations. Correlations are when two random things tend to change together in a particular direction. Positive correlation is when two things tend to change in the same direction. Think of ice cream consumption and your aircon usage. And there's also negative correlation, where things will change in opposite directions. Think of time in a PhD program and your general well-being. But most people would recognize that just because two things tend to change together doesn't mean that one is causing the other to change. I'm going to denote x as the cause and y as the effect. But to be more precise, x is going to be a potential cause. I'm calling it potential because we're usually interested in figuring out if there is a cause and effect relationship. If I just call it a cause, it sort of implies that the relationship is already there. There are lots of different ways to think about causal relationships, but for this video, we'll stick to the counterfactual framework used in statistics. For a quick refresher, a cause is something that changes the distribution of the effect. It's the difference between the outcome when the cause happens and the outcome when the cause doesn't happen. Unfortunately, causal relationships aren't easy to find. A major obstacle to finding one is the confounder. If we're trying to figure out if a relationship exists between a potential cause and an outcome, then the confounder is any variable that's associated with both of them. It'll indicate a relationship between two random variables with an arrow. Confounders will distort the relationship between x and y, whether or not there's an actual relationship between them. One solution to the confounder problem is to just adjust for them in our statistical model. But it's impossible to know if we've collected all the confounders between x and y. There will always be the possibility that there's a confounder that we missed or don't even know exists. This is the problem of the unobserved confounder. You might be tempted to think that statisticians would need some fancy method to differentiate between causes and correlations. But actually, what if I told you that all we needed to do was flip a simple coin? Of course, it's more than just one coin flip, but it really captures the essence of the solution. All statisticians need is randomness. To get an average causal effect, we just need to randomly assign some people to receive the cause and for others not to receive it. This is how randomized controlled trials, or RCTs, get medicines approved for our use. And it's the same mechanism behind A-B tests, which lots of tech companies use to improve their platforms. You're watching this on YouTube, so you're probably the subject of multiple A-B tests right now at this very moment. But it's not clear how randomly assigning the potential cause allows us to make this leap from correlation to causation. So let's dig deep into it. Unfortunately, statistical models by themselves can't distinguish between causation and correlation. So instead of trying to approach the problem in the analysis phase, we can actually set ourselves up for success by planning how we gathered the data in the first place. In the arena of biostatistics, this is known as clinical trial design, but more generally, it's simply called the design of experiments. It's so important that it's its own research topic in statistics, and it's what I personally research and teach. We know that confounders get in the way of isolating causal relationships. So somehow, some way, randomization needs to break these two associations simultaneously, the cause-confounder relationship and the outcome-confounder relationship. As a student, I do a lot of reading. I read to progress my research, 
I read when I'm trying to learn a new skill, and I read when I'm at the gym. But there's only so much time in a day and too many books to consider. Before I read a book, I want to make sure that it'll be useful to me before I buy it and commit to reading it. And thanks to Shortform, this is easier than ever. Shortform creates high quality book summaries that capture the main essence of a book. These summaries include the key ideas of a book, commentary, and even research brought in from other books that discuss similar ideas. Recently, I've been using Shortform to review Nassim Taleb's Inserto series to remind myself of the main ideas of his books. If you're interested in trying Shortform out, you can join through shortform.com slash very normal and receive a free trial of unlimited access. You'll get an additional 20% discounted annual subscription if you use my code. Thank you to Shortform for sponsoring this video. Think about the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. A hypothetical confounder in this relationship is age. For younger people, they might be less likely to smoke cigarettes since they're too busy using other forms of nicotine. On the other hand, older people may be more likely to smoke because that's what they grew up with. The specific reasons don't matter, but it's important to note that age influences the probability that someone smokes cigarettes. So if we're trying to compare two groups based on smoking and lung cancer, an imbalance of ages in the groups will probably cause an imbalance in the number of smokers in each group. This is an example of a cause-confounder relationship. When we randomize some people to experience the cause, and others not to experience it, we're actually implicitly controlling who gets it and who doesn't. We're not specifically choosing who gets what treatment, but we're the ones who make the randomization list that assigns a person to a specific treatment and this control is what matters here. This control blocks any influence that the confounder might have in who experiences the potential cause. We're effectively making the cause independent of the confounder. What's left now is the outcome-confounder relationship. Remember that the main problem here is that we can never know if there's an unobserved confounder that we didn't take into account. To understand how randomization solves this problem, it'll be useful to walk through a toy example. I played soccer in high school. Some of the people on my team were relatively new to the sport, and others had played it their entire lives. In other words, there was a distribution of years of experience among the players on the team, and by extension, a distribution of skill. One of the drills we would do would be to divide everyone into two teams and play against each other in a scrimmage. If the coach's goal was to make the drill as useful as possible to the team, how should they divide up the players among the two groups? One strategy would be to let the players pick the teams themselves. It's convenient because the coach doesn't have to do any work. But a problem with this is that the players won't care as much about making this drill useful. Anyone who's played a friendly scrimmage knows that you want to win. So, the more skilled players will cluster on one team, leaving the weaker players on the other. And I've been on the weaker team enough times to tell you that it's no fun. The distribution of skill is uneven, so of course the more skilled group is more likely to win. And the weaker team is less likely to have a chance to practice their skills. Another approach the coach could take is to randomly distribute the players across the two teams. While it's still possible for all the skilled players to be on one team, it's much more unlikely. What's more likely to happen is that the teams will have a more even distribution of skill between them. The idea is, even if skill has an effect on which team wins, this effect will be roughly equal between the two teams thanks to the similarity in the skill distribution. The effect of years of experience and skill sort of cancel out, enabling other factors to play a role in winning the scrimmage. The key behind randomization is this balancing of the confounder. In the soccer example, I only focus on one confounder, but randomization can help balance the distribution of multiple confounders simultaneously. It's easy to show this in code. I'm going to generate a sample of 500 people and measure three variables from each of them. These variables will represent different types of confounders. After this, I'm going to randomly assign them to one of two groups, A or B, with equal probability. Here's the distribution of the three variables across the entire sample. You can see that the distributions of the three variables resemble the law that generated them. And here's what the distributions look like once we stratify them by group. You can see that the distributions look similar, even though it's not quite exact. This balance is impressive considering that all we did was flip a simple coin to decide who's in what group, and there's immense power in this simplicity. Critically, it doesn't matter if I observe the confounders or not. Randomization is going to help balance them. Therefore, randomization helps us isolate causal relationships between a potential cause and an outcome because it theoretically breaks any and all associations they might have with any confounders. We're handling the confounders in the design phase rather than the analysis. 
In theory, under randomization, we wouldn't need to adjust for any confounders in the model. Despite this, it's still common to adjust for confounders in the analysis. Randomization is an extremely powerful tool in a statistician's toolkit, but it's not without its problems. In some cases, it may not be possible or even ethical to randomize humans to particular potential causes. In the original statistical debates on smoking, one of the key problems was that you couldn't randomize people to smoke because there was a growing body of evidence that smoking harmed people. Smoke. For people who study policy, you can't just randomize some people to follow a new law and others not to. But when we can randomize treatment, it gives us our best shot at uncovering cause and effect relationships. Today, billions of people like myself can breathe freely because of the small inhaler. And it wouldn't be available to us if it didn't prove its effectiveness in not just one, but several clinical trials. And underneath all of these clinical trials was the absurd power of randomness. If you like this video, then consider subscribing for more statistical content. You can also get updates on new videos sent directly to your email if you subscribe to the channel newsletter. In one of my most recent issues, I look through how much money this channel makes on a daily basis. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one.